Amidst the personal home computer boom of the mid to late 80s, perhaps none were as influential to me as the Amiga, Commodore's overpowered successor to the immortal C64. Over the course of its initial lifetime, and even still to this day, the type of creativity and technological achievements is among the most fascinating and unique in all of gaming history, as is the history of the downfall and demise of Commodore themselves during the days of the Amiga. But its library and software, while unforgettable to those of us who grew up with it, has been woefully underrepresented when it comes to retro gaming content, save for a few YouTubers and the likes out there, perhaps primarily due to a somewhat misrepresented difficulty of entry via emulation or just a sheer amount of the unknown and lack of documentation outside of Europe for the machine. But now, Retro Games Limited has provided us with a brand new plug and play solution that promises to bring easy and comfortable entry to the Amiga library to all ages and interest fields, much like they've done with their prior the C64 Mini and full size. So is this the solution we had been hoping for for this machine? Well, let's take a quick look today and see how it fares and what it offers, as this is the A500 Mini. Now the story of the Amiga, its rise and downfall and everything in between is far too interesting of a story for someone like me to try to illustrate in mere minutes. But with videos such as Flatline by Ahoy, you can learn about this juggernaut of a machine crashing out of the gate and stumbling its way to success before eventually imploding. But for its time, it was a beast of a machine, one which was way ahead of its time and allowed for true 16-bit gaming and arcade perfection long before consoles reached that point with any consistency. This here though is the A500 Mini, a device that in name takes its inspiration from the eventual budget release of the Amiga 500, the most popular of the Amiga family primarily thanks to the incredible success of the Batman Pack, a bundle release of the machine which came with the Ocean Software tie-in game. The original Amiga 500 operated on a Motorola 68000 clocking at approximately 7MHz, as well as 512KB of RAM, hence the 500. The A500, on the other hand, runs on an all-winner H6 chip, which is an ARM-based processor, and uses the Amiberry emulation software running at a base res of 720p. So basically, much like all the other mini devices, this is a complete emulation solution, though one that bases itself very closely on the Raspberry Pi 3 era of hardware support and brings a somewhat higher accuracy and compatibility due to having its roots in WinUAE, the de facto emulation solution for Amiga as a whole. Being that this is a device that runs on familiar hardware with tried and true software emulation, there really isn't much in the way of surprises, nor does it really bring about anything new in terms of issues that wouldn't have already been seen and fixed on a Raspberry Pi device. But before going into all the games, all the software, let's take a look at the build quality of the unit itself. It features a display keyboard with three USB ports, support for HDMI output, USB-C for power, and a little power button. Now, for just aesthetics alone, this is a beautiful little device that really brings me some warm, fuzzy feelings. The plastic is fairly high grade, but this here power button, it really doesn't do it for me. I need something with a bit more feedback and click to it, and this just feels a bit cheap. Perhaps if the floppy eject button was the power instead, there could have been some room for another USB port even, and a nice solution. But before I make it any more clear I didn't date much in high school, let's move on to the controllers. Packed in with the system is the mouse and the A500 gamepad, both being quite necessary in order to play all the games provided on the unit. The mouse is a slightly smaller sized replica of the Amiga mouse and feels suitably authentic if not a bit light to the touch and is now optical rather than ball based. The controller is a bit more interesting. Taking its inspiration from the Amiga CD32 controller, itself an ill-fated consoleized version of the Amiga 1200 from 1993, this offers something of a new standard, I guess, for the Amiga with its release. Again, the build is serviceable, and the button layouts is adjusted and more modernized compared to the 1993 controller. It is with the D-pad that we see both an improvement and a step back in my opinion. The original controller used this circular shaped disc pad which was not entirely awful but not too hot either, especially not for precision based controls. 
The A500 gamepad improves on this by employing a PlayStation style D-pad which feels much better to use in theory, but where it falls short for me personally is the fact that it is disjointed and the buttons themselves feel a tad bit stiff to the touch, meaning that after 15 minutes or so, my hand looks like Killer Kowalski looking to end the match and it made me long for a different pad altogether, which led me down another path entirely. So in my testing of finding a more appropriate solution for my controller needs, I tested many a controller via either direct USB connection or via USB converter. And in this testing, I found that many controllers that I had thought would be a slam dunk, such as the PS4 controllers, not always corresponding properly to the button mappings that the device gives to the A500 pad. In fact, I found that only this, the 8 SF30 controller set to the A button mode, I'm not sure what it's called, the one where you hold the A button, doesn't matter, worked perfectly with the device, and as such, I switched over to it entirely. Hopefully this is something that can be improved with future firmware updates, and if mouse emulation could be added to say the analog stick, we'd be in business, but alas, for now, they are used separately. Of course, for many, the question will be, does the keyboard work? And like the C64 Mini before it, it is only there for display purpose. And the keys are so small that trying to use them would result in some serious Homer Simpson calling 911 moments. But it certainly brings to mind that a full-size unit with a functional keyboard like the C64 full-size would be an excellent complement to this device, as it is never ideal to plug in a USB keyboard, a mouse, and a gamepad all into the same mini device by your comfortable couch setup. But of course, the unit does provide a virtual keyboard as well. As you can see, the presentation of this is rather fantastic in my opinion. It evokes a lot of memories, though the keyboard situation and the controller does leave a little bit to be desired. But let's take a look at the actual software that this thing runs. When booting up the system, you want to be mindful of one specific thing. See this? Now you might be tempted to just put this at 60Hz and run the games at supposed 60 frames per second and enjoy some retro gaming according to the John Lindman gospel. However, the games on the Amiga were primarily developed by and for European standards, meaning that the correct refresh rate of these games is in fact 50. So find a display that supports it and select 50 to ensure that your gaming will be as accurate of an experience as possible. After that, you're greeted by this lovely Netflix-like front-end which carousels you through the game selection. But before we jump into all these video games, let's look at the options on display here. The display options allow for the usual suspect of screen size and filters, though the Amiga in particular was a bit different from your usual consoles with the resolution being programmable and often differed from game to game which when projected on a 4.3 CRT screen would not be much of an issue, but modern digital outputs can be off-center or heavily bordered compared to the CRT equivalent. The options here then basically allows for a dynamic crop which has been predefined for each game. So taking a look at each of these options, we'll see that fixed size leaves the game centered and at an original res, and screen fit will dynamically zoom each game in and use all of the available space vertically. The CRT filter option is the usual unsatisfying affair of simply applying dark lines across the screen to create a dim approximation of what a CRT experience could be, while an image smoothing option here increases the interpolation and applies a bilinear blur filter across the entire screen to smooth it out. I was originally quite concerned that this mode would be one of those dreaded 2x eagle-like filters on emulators that smudges all the graphics, but I was relieved to see that it's just an awful blur filter at the very least. Now if you ask me, I would just leave this at screen fit and leave everything else disabled, though you can certainly play around with what you feel is best for you, though it should be mentioned that if you use both CRT filter and image smoothing, you're dead to me. Beyond this, there's little in the way of true customization here in the main options. The one option to point out is the LED simulation, which makes the power lights on the unit simulate floppy disk accessing. And this is not just a mere novelty piece to ignite some nostalgia, but it can also help indicate just when games are in fact loading, which becomes a bit more important later on this review. You might also want to enable this screen edge option depending on how your monitor deals with 720 input. So what about the games then? Well in fact, this comes with 25 games packed in. Now out of those 25, I wouldn't say that that many of them are bonafide classics of the Amiga. In fact, some of them are quite questionable in quality. 
Now, I actually have a lot of sympathy here because having worked as a producer on compilations that dealt with C64 and Amiga software, the licensing situation is very complicated in ways that traditional console game licenses based in Japan simply aren't for the most part, and even the units itself bear some signs of these licensing difficulties. Ask 25 people what games they want on a mini console, you'll get 25 answers, and out of those games, 5 will perhaps cross over. Now this is a scientific fact that I came up with right now out of my rear end, but there's some truth to it. You can never have the perfect game list necessarily, but this here has one of the worst ratios of good to bad games on a mini console thus far. However, due to a certain other feature we'll discuss later on, we have to put that statement with a big asterisk. Let's take a look at the games in alphabetical order and see what we got though. Though I will leave one out for last as I actually think that's the greatest game ever made and it deserves something like a top spot. Alien Breed 3D courtesy of Team 17 is a first person shooter that gives the term Doom clone validity. Doom itself would be somewhat of a signal of the end of the Amiga as a viable platform as it was apparent that the machine would never be able to run something like Doom, but Alien Breed 3D is a pretty neat attempt despite the small viewing window and blocky graphics that would make Doom on the SNES blush. Room above rooms, great art direction, at least when you can see it, and superb music really makes this a cool little game. Though the performance you're seeing here on this unit is not exactly indicative of how it ran on the original Amiga as I remember it. Alien Breed Special Edition 92, again from Team 17, is an updated version of the first game in the Alien Breed series and a rather fantastic game, one of the gems that you will find on the A500 Mini. An overhead shooter with an emphasis on exploration and terror, with a surprising number of enemies on screen at times, it's really just a superb game and absolutely worth your time. Now Arcade Pool. Um, I'm gonna be quite honest with you, I am not someone that can really evaluate this type of game as I never even played pool in real life and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with a stick and balls. My wife can confirm this. But the physics here seem to be quite well done for the time, so for presentation alone, I'll give it a pass. Shockingly, this game was also published by Team 17. ATR All-Terrain Racing is an overhead racer with a much more dynamic edge than generally seen on the genre at this time. And this is a game that I actually played a lot with my friends in the mid-90s, very late in the Amiga's lifetime, but somehow I stumbled upon a copy of this. It has some superb graphics and music, and the game handles way smoother than what the Amiga generally offered. The game also allows for two players, and was a favorite of mine, so perhaps Rich would like to come play with me and enjoy some Amiga- Get out of my office! Oh, uh, I guess Rich is busy. I'll, I'll ask him later. Would you believe though that this game is a Team 17 game? Now Battle Chess. Battle Chess is a classic for its time, considering the early release date and the birth of Interplay as a company. It's a game of chess and the pieces animate and feature several action animations. It's all good fun for a few minutes, but it's dreadfully slow and a sedate experience that perhaps doesn't quite survive when being in an introduction and showcase of the Amiga today. But for fans of battle chess, I guess they're happy seeing it here. I would think though personally for me, even though it's not a chess game, that something like Defender of the Crown would be a better entry here. Cadaver, Cadaver, I don't speak English, is an isometric adventure game from Bitmap Brothers, the first title we're seeing here from this legendary cult company on this unit, and it's a really beautiful looking game. While I generally enjoy these isometric adventure games, I've always found Cadaver, Cadaver, a bit too much on the difficult and cryptic side of things, but this genre, as well as this company, is an important aspect of the allure of the Amiga, and I'm pretty happy seeing Bitmap Brothers finally on this list. California Games is that classic epic sports title which made the splash on the C64 and basically every other console at the time, and here is rather crudely ported to the Amiga. I really have to admit that I never saw the love for this game then or now, outside of perhaps the footback event, and this conversion really doesn't look too hot and feels extremely cheap. It's the first real dud on this unit, and I really want to avoid it. Chaos Engine is another effort from Bitmap Brothers, and this is perhaps the best they ever did. This is an overhead action game that pits you in an open field, activating nodes, finding keys, and taking out enemies all while dressed to the nine, steampunk clothing and accessories. Now in order to enjoy Chaos Engines, you really need two players, and perhaps Rich would want to join me and play some Chaos- Get out of my office! Alright, that's the end of that joke.
Interestingly though, this seems to be the AGA version, and AGA is not something that the stock Amiga 500 could run. In short, AGA, or Advanced Graphics Architecture, was a later chip that allowed for much greater visual fidelity, such as many more colors like seen in this game. So while it is the A500 Mini, it does seem to go beyond the Amiga 500 in scope at least. Dragon's Breath... I think it's supposed to be some sort of strategic role-playing game, but I just have no idea what I'm doing and like, what the hell? I am frightened and I would like to move on. F-16 Combat Pilot does as the name suggests. It lets you pilot an F-16 as a combat pilot. Another game that I'm not quite sure belongs on this unit as it only caters to a very small demographic of people and even then, I don't really know if this game provides much excitement now, nor does it really feel that impressive even for an Amiga 3D game. Another one to just avoid. Kickoff 2 is a fairly popular soccer game which plays much like me playing soccer in real life, that being, at least to me, completely uncontrollable and best substituted. And that's kind of how I feel like most people would think when they look at this inclusion. Many people remember Kickoff 2, I'm sure, but here it really does feel like a stand-in for Sensible Soccer. And Sensible Soccer should have been the inclusion here in terms of popularity and playability, but I suppose that licensing got in the way of that. The Lost Patrol is one of the greater standouts to me on this unit. I had actually not played this one before this review, only seeing it in one of the magazines back in the day and discarding it as a mere war simulator. However, what you get is an incredibly gut-wrenching survival simulator set in the Vietnam War, way ahead of its time in terms of features and featuring some truly incredible artwork that brings out the beauty of a country torn up by war, as well as these small FMV sequences and even action sequences. Perhaps one day we'll find a way to talk more about this one because it really deserves it, but I would highly recommend for now to check out Kim Justice's video on this game which I discovered when researching this after playing it for this review. And her channel in general is Ace, so even if you're not into this type of game, I highly recommend that you give her video a look. Paradroid 90 is an update to Andrew Braybrook's C64 original, and while that game is a classic, I find Paradroid 90 to be a frustrating and overtly difficult game that beyond some nicer graphics and animations really doesn't seem to provide much over that C64 original. Paradroid has its fans out there, but I don't really know if it's an essential Amiga experience, but it's here and for those who like it, I guess it's a good game. I just couldn't get into it. Pinball Dreams is unsurprisingly a video pinball game from none other than DICE, and the first in their very successful line of video pinball games that include pinball fantasies and illusions. Four tables to choose from, fairly good ball physics, an excellent presentation overall, though I personally feel that Fantasies is the much superior game and has a better overall presentation and feel, so while Dreams wouldn't be my first choice to include on this unit, it does a serviceable job. I just really wish that I was playing Fantasies. Project X Special Edition 93 is yet another Team 17 joint and a horizontal shooter with some outstanding music and a really good visual flair, though it is an extremely difficult experience. This is somewhat interesting to me because if I recall correctly, this special edition of the game was primarily done to mitigate the absolutely insane difficulty of the original version, which was described in magazines as unbeatable. So the fact that this is the easier version makes me really curious how hard that original is. Not a bad game per se, though again it just makes me wish that we could have gotten something like Wikipedia or Disposable Hero to highlight the horizontal shooter genre on Amiga, rather than this. Quack is an arcade style action game from... Uh, Team 17, what a surprise, and features some Bubble Bubble-esque mechanics. Basically catch the fruit, avoid the bad guys, exit with the key, it's a simple, timeless affair and really fun with the second player, but as has been established I don't have anyone to play with so this is an eternally single player experience for me. The Sentinel is one of those games that on paper sounds really cool, and at the time, in that moment, probably was really cool, but my god, it is busted when you play it now, 
And it's a game that originally came out for much simpler machines and the 3D effect was truly a marvel to behold on those. But on the Amiga, it just simply does not have the same effect. And I remember hating this game as a kid because my friend's dad absolutely loved it and played it for quite some time. I know though that this is a me problem. And if you're one of those people that feel like this does indeed belong in the greatest of all time category, then more power to you. I just really couldn't stomach this more than a few minutes. Simon the Saucer is the singular point and click adventure on this device, an excellent addition. However, it is a bit of a letdown that this is not the CD32 voiced edition. Chaos Engine was clearly the AGA edition, and Amiberry does have support for CD32 games I believe, so I assume this came down to sheer storage size restrictions or something like that. But nonetheless, it would have been a great addition to have the talk version of this game as it is the superior version. But what's here is great, it's a true classic. Speedball 2 Brutal Deluxe is another staple of the Amiga, and it truly is a must-have game for a mini unit such as this. It's an excellent futuristic ball game that really brings together sound, style and mayhem for a truly awesome time. As much as it is a sports game, it is also a straight up action co-op game, so this is one where you grab a buddy and have a good time. It's basically the smash TV of ball gaming. Stunt Car Racer though is another one of those games that made a name for itself doing 3D on the micros and got a port to the Amiga later on where it runs marginally better than what was seen on the C64 for example, though it doesn't really bring much new to the table. It's not all that bad, it's fun in short spurts, but it really doesn't showcase anything special about the Amiga in particular and it feels like a retread of an older game, which it is. Supercars 2 is a game that on its own provides enough fun for an hour or two, but at least for me it always felt a bit dull when it came to the actual top-down racing segments in comparison to even ATR which we saw earlier on the unit. What makes this one quite unique though is everything but the racing. From tuning your car to the many dialogues you'll have with other racers, it's really fun when you get to those parts, but the racing itself is just so drab until you tune up your car enough. Now Titus the Fox, it's awful, which actually means that it's just absolutely awful and really just completely awful. Now if we zoom in here and look at Titus at 200%, just as awful. It's a shockingly awful game and after you play for a few minutes, you'll eventually find that it's indeed awful. Now I'm perhaps not the right man to comment on a furry anthropomorphic character wearing a white shirt, so I'll defer to a famed video game critique. John Lindman for his educated opinion on this game. Nope, I don't like it. Worms the Director's Cut is the very last version of Worms released for the Amiga and is another famed AGA title that brings together all kinds of Worms in action for the ultimate experience. Now this one is a bit difficult because essentially it is a great game, a really great game, but the experience here on the A500 Mini is slightly hampered by some unintuitive controls in my opinion at least. They did do their best here, but I just never got the hang of the various button mappings and I felt myself by muscle memory reaching out for the keyboard only to realize I was alone, confused, and there is no keyboard here on this unit. By the way, did you know that Worms was developed by Team 17? Zool is one of those mascots from the Amiga era, and this one fared pretty well in the sea of forgettable mascots. This one is also one of the original collective fonts where the goal is to catch all the points, hit all those buttons to progress, but it controls really well and it looks beautiful here in this AGA version, though I do think that the eventual Mega Drive version feels much more precise and balanced than this Amiga version. Do absolutely check out Zool Redimension on Steam by the way if you enjoyed this game, as the team over at Sumo Academy really did a good job updating this for modern standards. And we here at Digital Foundry even did a video interview with the team for the channel. Lastly, I want to highlight what I think is the best game on the unit, and in fact the best game ever made, Another World. Yes, this is a game that I bring up often on the channel, but it bears repeating that this game, single-handedly, inspired me from the very first time I played in 1993 to join the games industry and seek creating experiences that could impact people the same way this game impacted me. It's an absolutely incredible game, thrusting you into an unknown world, creating a true bond and trust with a CPU controlled character and with an atmosphere that even to this day is almost unmatched in video games.
Though this version here on the A500 Mini is probably not the one you recognize from consoles or any of the anniversary editions, as this is an earlier version of the game that lacks some of the later content added to the other versions, as well as lacking checkpoints. This is a really difficult version of the game, so be prepared and maybe start it out with one of the anniversary editions before going back to checking out this where it all started. And with that, we've looked at every game on this unit. Now we haven't really done much in the way of comparisons and such to original hardware because really there's not that much to point out. The device runs these games fairly accurately and any slight differences in graphics and sound is quite minor overall. However, you can definitely detect some speed differences between blitter heavy sequences like the introduction to another world. If you look at this side by side comparison between a PAL stock Amiga 500 and the A500 Mini, you'll see that they often go out of sync and there are speed differences between certain segments of the introduction. It is not a big difference per se, but it's certainly there and it might be something you notice if you're really familiar with the game. But basically, if we ended the review here, we'd be saying that this unit is interesting, but it's a bit unbalanced when it comes to the game selection, and the controller leaves a little bit to be desired. But what is interesting about this, and the biggest selling point of it, is our last talking point, the WHD load support. WHD load is essentially an archived image file of a game optimized and configured to run its best on original hardware. It is sometimes cited as an emulation solution, but in fact the WHD load is developed for original hardware and performs the same there as it would on any emulated device. What's most important is that WHD load compiles floppies into a single drive image, basically removing any need for disk swapping, which is how many of us entered puberty, and creating a single file solution to any game on the system. For the A500 Mini then, it effectively means that it consolizes the game experience further thanks to the easy setup and running them in a mere drag and drop effort. Retro Games themselves provides the WHD load profile on their websites, which needs to be put on a USB drive. And from there, you easily compile your own VHD load files by having the original Amiga, customized software, hours of your time, and dumping your old floppy disks to finally put on the same USB drive, which I'm sure all of you know how to do, and you won't just go download a full set from your nearest ROM site. From there, essentially the entire world of Amiga is at your fingertips. This also brings about some additional options for us to look at. When going into the menu and selecting a game, you can configure each game to your liking by applying the amount of crop, button mappings to your liking, and with the expert settings here, you can even go a deeper dive into zoning in that experience and ensuring maximum compatibility. Now, I assume many of you watching this might not even be sure what some of these settings do, but for the most part, you can just apply auto center, apply some slight crop, and you should be fine by and large. And man, look at this. Now we can enjoy an entire library at a simple push of a button. And there are so many games to discover here. What's really neat about this is also the selection of the joypad and the settings. Games such as Fighting Spirit, which is a surprisingly good SNK style fighter for the machine, can make use of all the buttons on the gamepad for that proper arcade fighting experience. There are just so many games to check out for the Amiga, so rather than going on and on about it here, I just say curate a small list, go bit by bit, genre by genre, and see what it offers you. As I began to capture footage for this review, I did actually detect games that the unit did not want to run in VHD load. But as I was finishing up, a new profile was released by Retro Games, which essentially fixed all the issues I found which is bad news for my work timeline, but great news for consumers as it seems like these fixes are being sent out swiftly. So we've come to the end of the review. And what's my thoughts then? Well, I actually love my time with this. It's a very simple emulation box. Yes, it's very close to Raspberry Pi, yes. But it's a welcoming and simple pick up and play device that consolizes the Amiga just like it promises. And for friends that I rekindled my friendship with recently, who I played Amiga with back then, we've had a lot of fun playing this, and specifically this. It's very inviting, it's very simple, and casual people really do gravitate towards these products. Now, there's certain things that definitely need some help. That controller I will never use again. And if you're the kind of person that has a recall box or a mister, 
then you're already an emulation expert and your parents are very proud of you. However, I'm not sure if that's really the market this is going for. So it's a bit twofold in that. If you already have your recall boxes, if you already have your emulation setups that you're comfortable with and customized, this isn't going to offer anything new. But for those who are curious about the Amiga, this is a great way to start. You'll get a pretty accurate representation of the Amiga. And even if you use that stock controller that it comes with, it's not that half bad, but you can always do better. So that's my final thoughts then. It's a good little device. It's not perfect, but most of you will have fun with it. And we can only hope that with time, much like the C64's full size before it, it opens up the aftermarket for Amiga to an all new audience. With the C64 units, developers and publishers of modern retro video games for the C64 has really skyrocketed in profit. And with these new devices, it basically gives them a brand new platform to target. And with WHD load, you can even specify your settings and button mappings to the A500 Mini, meaning that you can target this device specifically. So it will be very interesting to see how the community and developers react to this release. So with that, we've come to the end of this video. If you liked it, of course, subscribe to our channel, check out my wonderful colleagues' videos every single week here at Digital Foundry, and do subscribe to us on Patreon, where John and I do retro videos, much like this, and Q&As, and many other exclusives every single week. It's a wonderful community, and it's a wonderful place to take part. So to everyone out there, take care of yourself and each other.